Hello, everyone. And first of all, um, thank you to uh, Russell, uh, Michael and Ian. Russell, thanks very much for making me feel nervous and small by reminding me of just how eminent your other speakers have been. Um, Michael, thanks for giving my talk. I can, I can stop now, uh, <laughs> given you've summed it up so well. And Ian, when I got the invite, uh, I wasn't quite sure whether to be delighted or furious. Uh, delighted because it really is a privilege uh, to, to be asked to come and speak to you. Uh, furious because it's on the one year when I can't actually visit um, ANU. Um, and in many ways, I, I think of ANU as my, my second spiritual home. Um, I uh, uh, grew up as a psychologist in Bristol with Arnie Tarshvel and John Turner. And then, as you know, John Turner uh, moved to Australia and moved to, to ANU. Um, and ANU became in many ways the centre, the global centre of work on social identity and, and self-categorization. And I remember coming, the first time I came to ANU was in 1996. Uh, and I remember it well because in that year it was when they just introduced on planes the moving map so you could see where you were. And I'd never been to Australia before and I remember flying along and seeing, if you like, this curve of cultural difference as we went along. You know, we went through Russia and then over Vietnam and so on. And then we arrived in Australia and I remember that evening um, eating uh, in the staff club at ANU, um, uh, surrounded by gentlemen in tweed jackets, um, eating shepherd's pie under pictures of grenadier guards. It felt as if the curve of, uh, of cultural difference had become uh, full circle. Um, clearly things have changed um, and I'm delighted to hear things changed and I was delighted to hear Ian start his introduction uh, by acknowledging the first Australians. Um, so it is good to see uh, how things are developing. And when I first came in 1996 uh, it was a pleasure not just for being uh, at ANU and not just for seeing John but meeting people who have become I hope friends for life like uh, like Michael, uh, like Kate, um, uh, seeing Alex Haslam and Craig McGarty were there at the moment. It really was a remarkable intellectual exercise, a remarkable intellectual atmosphere I should say. Now the social identity tradition I think is much misunderstood for many people, they think of social identity theory in particular as a theory of group discrimination, of hostility between groups. Uh, people in textbooks often cite the argument that when we get together in groups uh, and we think of ourselves in terms of our social identities, our sense of ourselves as a group member, then we seek to make that group membership positive and we can only do so comparatively by defining other groups negatively. And so people come to the conclusion that what social identity is telling us is there is something basic about human behavior, some basic tendency uh, to discriminate against other groups. Now, for much of uh, my career, I've tried to debunk what I think is a profound misunderstanding. Because what John Turner and Arnie Tarshfell argued always was that there may be a psychological tendency to want to be defined positively. However, the way in which that plays out is always going to be a function of the nature of the social world. And people forget that the second half of social identity theory was saying, well, look, we might want to be defined positively, but we live in a world that is racist and sexist and homophobic. That as a woman, you are defined negatively, whether you like it or not. As a black person, as an Aboriginal person, again, you are defined negatively. Or as a gay person, or a transsexual person, again, negative definition. So what do you do, given that reality? How do you respond? Do you try and accommodate with the system? Do you try and change the system? And what social identity theory was trying to do was to ask the question of when do we accept and accede to inequality, and when do we challenge it? And implicit in that model was the argument that challenging it is the same thing as acting collectively. As an individual, you navigate within the system. It's when we become together collectively as a group 
arguing not for me, but for us, arguing not for my personal uh, advancement, but for, say, Black Lives Matter. It's when we act collectively that we have the ability to change the world. And so, in many ways, for me, the core of the social identity approach was a theory not of discrimination, but of social change and social power. The point was that the group is a source of social power. That's why it has been so pathologized through the ages. The negative view of groups comes from the period of industrialization, the formation of mass society, elite fears about the masses. And those elite fears turned into uh, a, a sense of the mass as somehow inferior and dangerous. Psychology was a way of warning people off coming together collectively because they did become dangerous to elites at that point in time. So as I say, for me, what the social identity approach was all about was recovering that understanding of groups as a source of social power. Um, groups through that power being able to achieve change. And so through the 90s, the period when I first um, visited ANU, I was particularly interested in understanding the ways in which people could use groups for social change. The argument was very simple. It was saying that if, when people define themselves as a group, they act together in terms of the norms and the values and the interests of that group, then those who are able to define the group identity, define who we are and what we should do, have a tool of world-making power in their hands. The group, as I say, is that tool, that tool that can make and remake worlds. My argument was that social identities don't just reflect social reality, they're not just perceptions of what is. Groups and group identities are also aspirations. They're notions of how the world should be and their attempts to mobilize people to act in order to change those social worlds. And in many ways, I had many discussions with John uh, over that time. And although they were uh, robust as they always were with John, uh, John was one to reflect and I think to take things on board. And it's interesting, I think, that his late work, his last work, his last published paper, 2005, was on power. And the point he makes is that power has generally been conceptualized in groups as power over. In other words, power is the ability to impose upon the group. A leader is somebody who uh, imposes them and tells the group what, uh, what to do. And John developed the concept of power through. His point was, no, you have real power, not when you impose yourself on group members, not when you uh, uh, try and put your views over their views. It's precisely when you are in a position to shape their views. When you are of the group and in a position to define the group identity, then people will want to act in the terms you enunciate. And therefore you have power through them and real power and effective power is power through people. And that insight, that core insight, has been very important and is at the core of the work on leadership that I have done with uh, Alex Haslam and of course with, with Michael Plato as well. And the point I'm gonna try and make to you today is that when it comes to the present pandemic, when it comes to COVID-19, in many ways, the core issue is whether in different nations and in the responses, there has been an attempt to impose on people to achieve power over people, which has been ineffective, or whether leaderships, uh, governments have worked with their population and achieved power through the population in order to overcome the pandemic, or at least to contain it to some extent. So let me now move from uh, some general reflections on the social identity tradition, on these issues of collectivity and power, uh, to talking about COVID-19. Now, as is self-evident, in many ways, I, and I used to say, until we get a vaccine, and I'll amend that in a moment, but the core thing we can do to deal with COVID-19 is to change human behavior. This is a disease which thrives precisely 
because it benefits from human sociality. It's when we are close together, it's when we embrace each other, it's when we touch each other that we transmit the virus and therefore the virus thrives. And that's why it's so difficult to deal with because we are trying to ask people to be less physically proximate, to be less intimate, to be less social in many ways. That's the real dilemma. And what we need to do, of course, is to ask people to undertake various mitigating behaviors, to ask people to wear masks and therefore limit our social interactions with each other. It's not pleasant wearing masks. We're asking people to observe hygiene. And most of all, we're asking people to keep physical distance from each other. And if we could do all those things and do them perfectly, then the disease could no longer thrive. It couldn't pass from one person to another. It would quite quickly uh, die out. But of course, these things are almost uh, impossible to do absolutely. And even limiting them is something of immense difficulty. So the question of human behavior and how we can change human behavior is right at the core of this world crisis. And in my life, I have never seen such interest in psychology, never seen such discussion of psychology, never seen psychology on the front pages of the newspapers or in the evening news. Absolutely crucial in many ways. And I made the point earlier about a vaccine. Well, of course, a vaccine will solve nothing. It's people getting vaccinated that will solve something. So again, it depends upon a human behavior. It depends upon a willingness to be vaccinated. And we know from the polling um, that many people say that they won't get vaccinated. Why? Because they lack trust in governments and lack trust in the safety of vaccines. So the question of getting people vaccinated is a core psychological question. And when it comes to the psychology of coronavirus, I think we can contrast two different views. The one view is an individualistic view of human frailty. I think in many ways the dominant model of human beings in psychology in the present period takes that form. Human beings are seen as creatures of limited processing capacity. We are seen to be frail in many ways. We can't cope with complexity. We can't cope with uncertainty. We can't cope with probability. We have to make do with simplifications, with uh, uh, biases. And so in many ways, the nature of the human creature is destructive, cognitively destructive. We distort and we simplify information. That uh, is at the core of our psychological apparatus. And if that's a generic problem, if we generically in all situations are beset by these limitations and these biases, this is exacerbated in the group. It's not just the cognitive overload of the group, it's also the stresses of the group. Um, that when you put people in a group, and you put people in a crisis, then ultimately people will crack and people will panic. And this panic perspective is very much at the core of government understanding of how people behave in a crisis. So for a number of years, um, I've been involved in doing work on how people behave in emergency and been involved in a number of government committees. And the question that is always asked is, look, can we give people information? If we give people information about danger, then they might panic and it might make things worse. And so it leads to a paternalistic notion that you need government to shelter people from the brutal truth of what's going on. You need to limit the information you give to people. You need to be relentlessly positive. You can't reason with people. If anything, you have to nudge them towards the right behaviors almost despite themselves. So this fragility perspective and this panic perspective and this notion that in a crisis people are the problem is very widespread. It's certainly widespread in our culture. You can't get a, a self-respecting Hollywood disaster film without people running away from danger, waving their hands in the air, uh, plugging up the exits and so turning a crisis 
into a tragedy where people can't get away and therefore are killed by whatever uh, danger it is that's lurking, whether it be fire or water or monsters or whatever. But still that perspective, as I say, is really powerful. And we've seen it in this pandemic as well. Notoriously um, in the UK, uh, there was in early March talk of fatigue, of behavioral fatigue. The notion that people are psychologically frail, that people can't put up with hardship, that, uh, that if you impose lockdown measures on people, they won't be able to go along with them. And therefore you have to wait because you've only got a limited amount of time um, in which you can impose them. And famously, again, in the UK, uh, our government uh, dillied and dallied and delayed in the week from the 16th to 23rd of March, in part based on this notion of behavioural fatigue. And the modellers tell us that as a result of that and the increase in the uh, uh, disease, which was then doubling uh, every four or five days, uh, probably tens of thousands of people died. So this notion is not incidental, it's not peripheral, it's an idea, it's an understanding of psychology which has literally killed tens of thousands of people. So what happened? What did happen when we had lockdown? Well, across the world, but I will apologise uh, for talking mainly about the UK, because the UK is the example uh, I've been most involved in, uh, that my life has become uh, COVID-19 in many ways for the last six months. I've become involved in the uh, uh, Behavioural Science Advisory Group for the UK government and um, in advising the Scottish government and also a group called Independent Sage, which seeks to give independent uh, scientific and policy advice. So uh, these things are very much in my, in my head. But what happened? Well, in many ways, people were surprised by the fact that people didn't panic. They showed remarkable resilience. There was a study done in uh, late April, early May in the UK, which showed that well over 90% of people were uh, adhering to lockdown, almost completely. Of those, 44% were suffering, suffering quite considerably, suffering psychologically, and suffering materially as well. But still, they went along with lockdown despite the difficulties. Now, the interesting thing is, because of the predominance of this frailty view and this panic view, people were surprised. And they attributed it to exceptionalism. In all sorts of different places, they attributed to, ex to exceptionalism. So in the UK, we like to think of ourselves as just wonderful. Uh, better than anybody else. So British exceptionalism, you know, the blitz spirit, we Brits, we went along with things when others wouldn't. In other countries and other places, people um, uh, invoke their own historical essentialisms. In, in New York, for instance, there was this notion of the New York, New York spirit, 9-11 and all that. But actually, it was a general phenomenon. And if one studies disasters and emergencies, it's not a surprising phenomenon because the literature on disasters and emergencies shows that the notion of overreaction, notion that people panic and uh, uh, respond excessively in ways that compounds the danger simply is not true. There are very few examples of it uh, where people die because they don't get out. It's rarely because of panic. It's often for material reasons in various famous studies, uh, for instance, the Beverly uh, Supper Club fire. <coughs> it was because the doors and the emergency doors had been locked shut. It had nothing to do with deficient psychology. And when you look in detail at what people do, you find that on the whole, they behave in an ordered way. And they behave in a uh, thought out way. And on the whole, they don't just rush for the exits and devil take the hindmost, they support each other. They refuse to leave without others. And those others sometimes are family and sometimes are friends, but sometimes are strangers. So how do you understand this behavior in emergency? How do you understand how it's so different from the image we've given of it? That was a question uh, which, I, uh, which I asked myself uh, about 20 years ago and did um, uh, a lot of work with John Drury, um, who was taking this work far further. And we started off from the presumption that, well, you might have different types 
of situations. You might have some situations where people are in a social group and some situations in which they are individuals. So we built a virtual reality uh, simulation of uh, King's Cross Underground Station in, in London. And in some situations we would have uh, people coming back from a football match where they were all wearing their colours and there's a fire. How do they behave? And in other situations we would have individuals just commuting, coming back in the evening. How would they behave? And what we found was that in all situations, actually, people helped each other. It wasn't just that in the group, because we had a sense of group membership and concern for other group members, we helped each other. It was in all situations people helped each other. And we began to realize that what was going on wasn't that it was necessarily a pre-existing social identity that led people to support each other. Rather, it was the fact that they were in an emergency and had a common fate, a shared experience that brought people together, that created a sense of shared identity, and which then led to helping. Because if people start thinking in terms of we rather than I, and start thinking about the well-being of others, then you begin to get those forms of solidarity. There's a lot of research that we've done showing that we help in group members more, we're more concerned for them, we're more empathic for them. Then under those conditions, people support each other and people help each other. So actually, not only now can we say in emergencies, people don't necessarily panic and don't necessarily uh, rush for the exits, but indeed do show help and do show solidarity. But indeed, we begin to have a process and we begin to have a mechanism which is rooted in the notion of social identity. It is to the extent that people think of themselves in terms of their common membership of a social group, that we, they will support each other and they will help each other. And moreover, they will coordinate each other and they, uh, as our virtual reality work showed, they are faster at exiting uh, a, a crowded underground uh, station. So social identity begins to be a resource for emergencies. Now, that was an argument we made at the beginning of the pandemic. In fact, back in early March, uh, John and I wrote a piece uh, called Don't uh, Individualize, Collectivize, that the ability to get people to adhere to difficult uh, prescriptions like lockdown depends upon thinking not in terms of what does it mean for me and what does it mean for my individual risk, but what does it mean for us? And indeed, if you think about it, if you are young, reasonably healthy, then on the whole, breaking lockdown, going out, doesn't pose a great risk to you. We're now beginning to learn about long COVID, so it might. But back then, we didn't know about long COVID. So the calculation you might have made was, look, th there's limited risk to me. On the other hand, if you're young, I have a a 16 year old who was still sleeping in the other room, it's, uh, uh, it's 8.30 in the morning here. Um, for him, staying at home with his uh, elderly parents is a huge hassle, a huge cost. So the cost benefit analysis would say, makes sense to go out. But of course, if you think in collective terms, if you think in terms of we, then the cost of going out is potentially infecting somebody else, potentially killing somebody else. And therefore the cost benefit analysis skews the other way against going out to staying in. So the thinking in terms of we rather than I, in terms of social identity rather than individual identity is absolutely central to adherence. It was put actually quite beautifully by the governor of New York, Andrew Cuomo, when he said, look, this isn't about I, it's about we. Get your head around the we concept. Um, and in many ways, that um, uh, quote inspired the book which we uh, have written. Uh, so uh, Tegan Chris, um, uh, hello Tegan, if you're in the audience. Uh, Yolanda Yetten, Alex Hasbam and I uh, wrote a book which is available as a free download. You can buy it as a hard copy if you like as well, but you can get it as a free download. Trying to help explain the we concept, or to put it more technically, understand social identity processes. As I say, at the beginning of the pandemic, um, this was a theoretical uh, claim based on previous empirical evidence. Um, but very quickly, evidence to began to mount up about the centrality 
of thinking in we terms. Um, so again, in by May, there was research in the UK showing that the best predictor of adherence was again not your sense of individual risk. Individual risk actually uh, related not very well to uh, adherence. It was much more a sense of being concerned for the community and wanting the community to come out of it well together. Um, a couple of weeks ago, a study came out, a 67 nation study, uh, 46,000 participants, um, so not a small little lab study, huge study, showing a clear relationship between attachment to the national community sense of national weeness and adherence. And there is, uh, have been other studies showing, for instance, that local identification, a sense of being connected to and part of the local community was critical. So quite a lot of evidence now mounting up to confirm what we found in emergencies before, that shared social identity is absolutely critical to, um, uh, to adherence but not just to adherence. Oh, incidentally, I see on the chat that Tegan has put up the link to the book so you can uh, all uh, go home and read it tonight over your cups of cocoa or something stronger probably after this. Um, it's not just that social identity and shared social identity, that sense of weeness is critical to adherence, but to other things as well. What we saw again throughout the world was a remarkable growth of community groups and community support. Again, people thought it was just us, that sense of exceptionalism in the UK. We thought, oh, well, that's British, you know, going around to your neighbor with a cup of tea. That's what we do, others don't do it. Of course, it was rot, it was, as I say, that general process. But certainly in the UK, we did see that growth of solidarity. We saw over a million people volunteering to help the National Health Service. We saw over 4,100 mutual aid groups involving over 3 million people supporting each other. And that was only the tip of the iceberg because virtually on every street, certainly on my street, face group, uh, groups grew up and neighbors put notes through each other's doors saying, can we help you? Are you okay? Do you need food delivery? And, and so on. We saw a remarkable growth of these community groups. And uh, at the moment I'm involved in a project uh, and one of the strands is looking precisely at social identity processes as critical to the growth of these groups. And the other point to be made, and I think this is an important point, so I'll return to it at the end, is that when it came to dealing with a pandemic, of course you need the support of the state, but it's not just the state. The state doesn't have enough resources to support everybody to an individual level, to deliver food to all those we need to deliver food to. In many ways, it was the self-organization of the community that was the key resource in getting us through this pandemic. So shared social identity, critical to adherence, critical to mutual support, and the third dimension is linked to the work, which again, that Tegan uh, has done and which uh, others have done, uh, people like Kath Haslam, Yolanda Yetten, uh, Alex Haslam and so on, on what is called the social cure. The fact that group membership doesn't just empower us, group membership is remarkably powerful and important to us in terms of maintaining our mental as well as our physical health. I think one of the great tragedies of this pandemic was that early on we started talking about socially distancing. What we needed to do, of course, was to remain physically distant. Because if we were physically close, we catch the infection and we can die. But at the same time, we need to be socially together. That's why we call our book Together Apart, because if we are socially together and feel supported by others and feel empowered by others and see others not as an impediment to us, but a resource who can help us deal with the problems of everyday life, then that's what keeps our uh, mental health and, as I say, even physical uh, health together. So the group is an asset uh, in terms of well-being. 
uh, quite as much as it is an asset in social terms, in terms of empowering us to effectively manage our lives. So in many ways, as I say, the notion of an emergent social identity is quite critical and nurturing that social identity and developing that social identity is critical. Because the point is that as all the research on emergencies and disasters shows, yes, you get a sense of an emergent social identity, but at the same time, it's something fragile. It's something that can uh, be supported, but it's something that can be breached. If you look at work on, for instance, flood relief, and uh, I've just had a, a Chinese student who did a, a wonderful study of earthquakes in, uh, in China. The authorities can blunder into these situations. They can uh, set up forms of aid which privilege some groups over others. They can lead to divisions within the community. They can rupture that sense of shared identity. So what becomes critical is the extent to which governments have either brought us together or moved us apart. Now, sometimes, of course, their actions have been deliberate. Sometimes their actions have deliberately sought to divide and deliberately sought to polarize. Uh, we've seen that clearly in the United States, where Donald Trump in order to mobilize his base and try to win the election in, in three weeks time, very clearly tried to politicize the pandemic and uh, tried to undermine the public health uh, calls for, for instance, wearing masks, uh, trying to turn it into an issue of Second Amendment rights, of, of, your, of your basic freedoms. It's not inevitably seen as such. It wasn't seen as such in many other countries, certainly not in, in the UK, but uh, you know, in the US, a clear attempt to divide and to polarize. Equally, in some countries, there has been uh, an attempt to blame particular groups um, for the pandemic in order to, uh, uh, to gain political capital. We've seen it in the United States again with, uh, with Trump's talk of the China virus. We've seen it in India, where there was an attempt to blame Muslims for the, uh, for the pandemic. Um, and uh, uh, some people, uh, there was talk of what the, uh, the term that was used was Corona jihadism. Um, and so you can deliberately divide and you can deliberately set up particular groups as scapegoats. And if you look at the history, of pandemics very often they haven't been brought people together in fact they've led to um, uh, to pogroms um, certainly during the black death for instance uh, jewish people were blamed for the black death uh, on one day on uh, st valentine's day 1349 in strasbourg um, 2000 jewish people were burnt to death having been blamed for the pandemic. So pandemics don't necessarily bring people together, they can divide, and bad leadership can divide people, uh, and bad leadership uh, can lead then to intergroup conflict. Sometimes, as I say, it's done uh, deliberately. It's done for political advantage, and I've given some examples. But I think, and here I want to come back to this notion of psychological frailty. Because I think sometimes that divisive narrative can come about, not in order to gain political capital, but in many ways um, out of this dominant understanding of human behavior and dominant misunderstanding of how people behave in emergencies. So I spoke a few minutes ago about the way in which that um, uh, notion of human frailty uh, had been used to talk about um, behavioral fatigue at the beginning of the pandemic. We're now seeing that notion of human frailty reemerge in blame discourses. So our government in the UK has begun to say, <coughs> look, if people get infected, it's because they've done something wrong. And the problem lies with the public and with a frail public. And if only the public would do the right thing, if only the public uh, wouldn't have parties, if only the public would keep their distance, all would be okay. So the pit finger has been pointed saying, you are the problem. And particular groups 
of people have been blamed, young people, students, house parties, uh, raves, that, that, that's what we've been told is the problem. Now, of course, uh, the point is you get infected because you've been exposed. And on the whole, you get exposed to the extent that you are more vulnerable and more deprived. If you are privileged and middle class and you can work at home, you don't get exposed. If you're working class and you work in a factory or retail, you have to go to work, you're more exposed. Um, you're more exposed if you have to go on public transport. You're more exposed if um, you live in multi-occupancy houses. In fact, in Britain, the infection has spiked amongst young people, not necessarily because they've done something wrong, but more because that young people uh, are most likely um, to work in uh, public facing jobs like, like, like retail or in bars and restaurants. Secondly, young people are most likely to use public transport. And thirdly, young people are by far and away more likely to live in multi-occupancy uh, flats. But this blame narrative has begun to say, well, the problem is the house party. Now, uh, the problem here, again, Actually, it has to do with the media, I think, to a large extent. But yes, house parties have been happening. And yes, they are spectacular. And yes, they'll get a front page headline in a way in which people abiding uh, by the regulations won't. People uh, sitting quietly at home is not a front page headline. And so we overestimate the extent to which there is deviation, there is an availability effect, if you like. Um, and, and, and the problem with that, of course, is it can be a self-fulfilling prophecy it can create um, social norms. People can begin to say, well, look, if everybody else is doing it, why shouldn't I do it? But I think there's a greater problem than that. And the problem is this. If the government sets the public up as an out group, if the, uh, the government says, look, it's your fault and wags its finger at them, then setting people up as an out group is a very bad way indeed of um, achieving social influence. Your only tool then is to use coercion and to say, well, and if you don't do things, then we will punish you. And in, in the UK, there is talk of 10,000 pound fines if you break uh, um, uh, lockdown, if you don't self-isolate when you're told to self-isolate. But again, the problem about using coercion is number one, that it's not very effective as a way of, of, of achieving compliance. Um, certainly, you, you may comply while the threat is immediate, but that might undermine your compliance in other areas where you can't be punished in the same way. So it's highly ineffective. And secondly, it may lead to social unrest uh, at the worst uh, in a number of countries where there's been a sense of illegitimacy of measures that are imposed combined with harsh, harsh repression, there's been rioting. All the procedural justice work, and plenty of that has gone on uh, at ANU, tells us that the best way of getting people to comply with authority is for people to um, see authority as on their side, to treat them with respect, not to blame them, to listen to them, not just to tell them what to do. And for me, the fundamental problem, certainly with the UK government response, has been that precisely because of its notion of public psychology as a frail psychology, as a, a crisis-led psychology. And precisely because they've begun to see the public as the main problem in this pandemic, it has led them to treat the public in ways that alienate them and treat them as an outgroup. They have violated virtually every lesson we've learned from the procedural justice literature. They um, treat people without respect. They don't listen. Uh, to people. They don't go through co-creation when, uh, when they talk about their measures, um, that they, uh, they patronize people, they use punishment as their main response. They fundamentally position the public as an outgroup. And if you position the public as an outgroup, the public will see you as an outgroup and it will undermine your ability to achieve power through the public. You will throw away that key resource. And so let me finish because I'm aware uh, that time is passing and I've spoken for longer uh, than I meant to, by drawing these things to a conclusion. To me, what this pandemic tells us in many ways is about this contrast between two psychologies. One, a psychology of individual frailty, uh, 
and the second a psychology of collective resilience that we are powerful not because of what is within us but when we come together and what happens between us we begin to see each other as i say as an asset as a resource others are no longer impediment others no longer stand in our way others help us to achieve what we want to achieve and that provides that remarkable uh, resource for dealing with a pandemic in a way that a state can't so that contrast individual frail frailty collective resilience secondly how important it is that the government and that the state understands that and doesn't see the problem uh, that the public as a problem but rather sees them as a partner thirdly that that partnership perspective is understood and implemented in everything that the government does so if instead of blaming people for non-adherence the government took its own responsibilities seriously about how it can help people to adhere so for instance take this issue of self-isolation actually it's a huge problem we have found in the uk that less than 20 percent of people who are asked to self-isolate actually self-isolate and the reason why is obvious it's a practical problem if you're not paid then how do you afford to stay at home if you live in a multi-occupancy house how do you self-isolate if you've got caring responsibilities outside the house what do you do how do you get food what about your emotional needs if the state saw its role as a partnership with the public where the state must take seriously its responsibility to support and help people not only would it enable them to adhere they would then come to see the state as on their side state as part of a common group of common cause and be motivated to do so as i say to me we need to switch away from this patronizing this uh, <coughs> paternalistic notion of the public as a problem to a partnership approach in which the public is seen as a key resource and if anything and if anything good comes out of this pandemic i hope that understanding might go further and that in the future we will have a sense whereby government should relate to the public again not in a paternalistic way but by scaffolding and supporting and funding the self-organization of the public i think there could be a fundamental shift in our understanding of the relationship between the state and the public if we understand uh, what has actually got on uh, gone on in this pandemic and so in concluding let me just say a couple of things if i wanted to be bombastic um, i might say that in many ways the future of the world certainly the way in which we get through this pandemic rests upon understanding social identity processes rests upon understanding these core concepts of power through of bringing people together in a group of leadership as working not by trying to impose on or be more mighty than the people but to be of the people and representative of the people and work with the people understanding those processes i think is critical and differentiates between those governments that have done well in this pandemic and those who've done badly. That's probably a little bit overstating it, to say the future of the world depends upon understanding social identity processes. So let me finish slightly more modestly. We as social psychologists like to quote a famous uh, quote from Kurt Levine, uh, where he said, there's nothing as practical as good theory. Well, I think what we've discovered in this pandemic is that there is nothing as practical as social identity research. We've discovered it in a way we suspected that we understood theoretically, and that theoretical work in large part developed at ANU and still being developed at ANU. We are now seeing it work in the world.